Hello, and um, welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Midday Lecture Webinar. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, um, and today I'm delighted to welcome um, James Watson. Hi, James. Hi, Adam. You okay? I'm very good. Uh, James is a PhD student from the University of Liverpool with a background in the NHS working in public health as a uh, primary analyst for older people's health and dementia and his research focuses on understanding variation in dementia care pathways. Um, today James is going to share his experience and advice of conducting a systematic review after recently completing one himself I believe which you can find a blog of uh, discussing on our website as well um, into the inequalities in dementia care pathways. Uh, the talk will be around 20 minutes and then we've allowed 10 minutes for questions at the end. And if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You can post those anytime throughout the chat or save them to the end if you like. Um, I will then put them to James who will answer them at the, the end. We're also recording today's uh, presentation. So if you do drop out, don't worry, you'll be able to visit our website later today or early tomorrow to find a uh, recording. Um, so thank you very much everybody again for joining us and James would you like to perhaps share your screen now? I'm James Watson, I'm a first year PhD student um, in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Liverpool. Um, I started um, my PhD at the end of September last year and pretty much since then I've been uh, doing the systematic review. Uh, we're coming to the end of it now um, and hoping to submit it for journal consideration later this month. Um, and so I thought I'd give a presentation today on discussing my uh, findings, um, the process as I've found it, uh, the importance of systematic reviews in general, and how I feel the review has benefited me. Um, so my PhD will be using routine data to look at socioeconomic and geographic variances in dementia care pathways and the health and social outcomes of those. Um, and as a result, we decided it would be useful to look at the previous use of such routine data internationally in exploring dementia care pathways and inequalities. Um, so firstly, I'm just going to go into a bit of what a systematic review does. Um, so in my case, um, a systematic review aims to provide a synthesis of literature related to a specific topic. Um, they're used to answer a focused research question using a reproducible search strategy with strict criteria for the literature to be included. Um, the steps of a systematic review are well defined but haven't spoken to other people who've done them before and haven't done mine. I wouldn't say what you have to do at each point is rigid. It's more about being open and transparent about the decision making process that got you to the final uh, results. Specifically, it's the research question and inclusion criteria um, and stating why papers were kept in and why papers were removed at each stage of the literature research process. Um, this is going to help demonstrate rigor in your methods, uh, strengthen your position when you argue findings, uh, argue your findings and conclusions that you've drawn from the papers. Um, this can be done uh, by devising a review protocol, um, as we would with a method section of any research. We go through the step-by-step -step process we intend to deliver to get to our end result. Um, so I'll go into a bit more now about the uh, guidance and the um, process guidance in particular. So the process for conducting a systematic review is set out in guidance from uh, two places. Well, for me, it was for two, from two places. So there's Prospero and Prisma. Uh, Prospero is the International Register for Systematic Reviews. And Prisma is, as they stated, an evidence-based minimum set of items for reporting systematic reviews. So it's basically the ideal for how to set up and populate the protocol. Um, writing the protocol and registering your review kind of go hand in hand. But first off, we need to know we're not duplicating already ongoing or completed uh, systematic reviews. And we can do that by searching the Prospero Systematic Review Register. Um, to do this, we kind of need to use the specific terms around our review. So in my case, we were looking at uh, cohort and routine data and inequalities in dementia. So I would search their database for those terms um, individually and collectively to see if there was no uh, reviews intended uh, based around the same topic that I was devising mine on. Um, in, if we then do have a unique idea 
into an important subject, I'd say it's likely to be accepted by Prospero and put on their register of reviews. Um, at this point, we can probably then start to devise our uh, protocol fully if we haven't already. Um, uh, and a protocol is a great tool for maintaining research process transparency. It describes the reason we're doing our review, our hypothesis, our, our aims, our objectives, and the methods we intend to use. Prisma has, as you can see in the bottom left, has really uh, good guidance for devising a protocol. Uh, it not only aids in transparency and validates our review to an extent, but it also helps us maintain an eye on why and how we plan to conduct our review. Uh, within the Prisma guidance, uh, there's 40 or so questions and it helps us to get on get down on paper why the review is so important. Um, in essence, it's a document we can refer to as we're doing our review to make sure we're doing everything we said we would. Um, so on to the actual lit search itself and uh, devising our inclusion and exclusion criteria. As the paper search and the inclusion criteria is kind of done hand in hand, uh, the guidance and from Prisma and Prospero deliver good information um, for carrying out this stage, but I'll give you some reflections on how I found it in practice. Um, so I wouldn't say anybody has got an idea for a systematic review without having thoughts on what the inclusion and exclusion criteria are likely to be. So you're already likely to have devised at least the skeleton search term based on the review name and topic and what you intend to do. Um, so the literature search, the search terms and the inclusion and exclusion criteria will probably become more defined as we go through the process. I imagine it would be strange to devise terms at the start and then stick with them throughout. Um, it's much more likely that it will be an iterative process and there'll be lots of little changes as you go until you get to the terms that you feel comfortable with and have brought back the results that match your uh, intended review. So my initial, I'll give a bit of reflection on that as in terms of how I did it. Uh, the initial searches that I ran were returning over 200,000 papers, which if you're then going on to have to read through the titles of all of those is a bit exhaustive. Um, and then the next one would return 50, which felt like it was either too loose or too restrictive in the terms we were using. Um, and although initially it felt a bit overwhelming with all the changes to the search terms you have to do, uh, you do kind of acknowledge as you're doing it and even more so when you reflect back that it is a process and it's important to get this stage right to make sure that you do have strength in and rigor in throughout and that you are including the papers that you need to include. Um, so in my case there were two primary content necessities really. So there was the use of routine and cohort data sets and uh, dementia care pathways. Um, as a result as you can see in the bottom left hand corner, that's my search strategy and it includes all the inclusion and exclusion criteria, as well as the search terms used and the databases are searched. Um, and it helps to kind of identify the population or the inter intervention we're looking at. In my case, it was older people with dementia. It also helps to uh, look at specific categories. So in my case, we were looking at papers published from 1990 onwards that were uh, in the English language. And it also helps to define the types of study you want to look at. In my case, it was quantitative studies using routine and cohort data sets and definitively no other systematic reviews. Um, so the search strategy helps consolidate what the review is about and the breadth it covers in the topic. It also helps to make the reader aware of um, the methods we employed um, so that they can judge the rigor that we've um, looked at so that our methods are matching what we intended to do it from the outset. So once we've carried out our literature searches um, and we've amalgamated the, res the results of the searches from the different sources, we need to remove any duplicates before we proceed. Um, this can be done quite easily, usually if you're using reference software. So if you export the references to that, it'll give you an option to remove any duplicates. The next step for me involved what should be a four stage process to get the final list of papers that will be included within the finding section of the systematic review. Prisma have a flow chart, which you can see in the bottom right there. That's the one I've uh, created for my systematic review. Um, it highlights the need to keep track of the numbers of papers included at each of the four stages. The number initially agreed upon independently by each of the reviewers at each stage. 
and also keep a tab on the reasons why papers were excluded. So defining why they did not meet the inclusion criteria to be included. So initially we should make a note of the number of papers we discovered from each source. As you can see at the top, it goes into the numbers returned through database searching and from other records. Um, and how we should also make a note of how many of these papers combined were retained once we removed the duplicates. Um, then onto the three stage process before that. The next three stages are screening by title, then screening by abstract, and then screening by full text. Um, this should always be done in relation to the exact inclusion and exclusion criteria we set out at the beginning of our, of our review. Um, and each stage, each of those stages is performed independently by each reviewer. And then re at each stage, reviewers then meet to run through each paper, discuss whether we thought they should be included or excluded, why we thought they should be excluded if so, and then come to an agreement on any discrepancy, discrepancies um, just deciding between us whether that paper should then be included or excluded before we then move on to the next stage. Um, with my systematic review, we combined the stages of screening by title and screening by abstract because it felt like a lot more work than was necessary given that the abstract will probably hold a lot more information and it will probably include the majority, if not all, of the words that were included in the title. Um, so once we've screened by full text independently and resolved any of those discrepancies, uh, we should have our full list of final papers to include in the review. Uh, with this list, uh, we then need to assess the quality of the paper. So we need to I identify the rigor and strength of the methods each paper used and therefore the strength of the outcomes they generated. There's a lot of different quality rating methods. Um, and truth be told, I don't know that many. With it being my first system at review, I was kind of learning on the job, if you like. Um, and I couldn't tell you which one to use if you were conducting your own systematic review. It'll depend on the topic you're looking at, the methods they used, whether it was qualitative, quantitative, or mixed, and also based on the population or intervention being reviewed. Um, I suppose it's, for me, it was a case of having a look around, ask an expert, of which I'm definitely not one, um, having someone else there who's done systematic reviews before who you can ask questions of. Um, in my case, the quality rating system we used was one devised and used by authors of a previous systematic review, which looked at dementia care variances by ethnicity. It's a six point system for quantitative research. Um, and I'm, I'll go into what the six points are. Um, the first was, was the target population defined? The second was, was probability something used to identify the potential respondents? The third was, did the characteristics of the respondents match the target population? The fourth was, were the data collection methods standardized? Five was the data collection measure used valid? And finally, was the measure they used reliable? Um, so if they met every one of those criteria, they would receive six points and therefore be deemed the highest possible quality in relation to our rating measure. Uh, this process is kind of a necessity if we're going to be able to devise a paper that's as strong as possible um, that includes all of the literature related to our topic. I'd imagine helps us produce a review more likely to have an impact and more likely to get published. Um, once we start reading the abstract and the full papers, it becomes a bit more interesting because we can kind of get to grips with what we are actually trying to find out from the outset. The process itself may not be overwhelmingly fun, but once you start narrowing down the papers, you can try and identify themes and try and interpret the findings as well. So the next stage I'll just go over is the synthesizing of the findings itself. Um, so what does the literature tell us? Um, again, this, this synth synthesizing the findings will vary depending on the type of review we're doing, whether it's qualitative, quantitative, uh, or a meta-analysis. Um, in our case, we looked at quantitative papers, but given that they use such a variety of methods and had so many different outputs they were looking at, it made sense to use a narrative synthesis. So this would uh, give us a descriptive textual uh, analysis of the findings, um, any consensus on findings across papers, and any points we thought were specifically pertinent to the topic we were looking at. Um, this stage of the process is kind of the same as a literature literature review in that sense. 
uh, we're trying to get an idea of what the papers around the topic are telling us and whether there's anything that multiple papers have identified. Um, in my review specifically, there were a few subheadings in the findings looking at different stages of the care pathway for dementia. Um, and from the literature, I've highlighted socioeconomic variances based on levels of deprivation, age, gender, ethnicity, and others in terms of prevalence of prescription of specific medications, likelihood of hospital admissions, likelihood of admissions for long-term nursing care, and long-term survival for people with dementia. Um, and as I've said, the findings start to come through when you're reading through the abstract, you notice themes emerging. Um, and it's important at this stage to try and make notes on things that jump out at you, things that keep coming up, and points that, again, are particularly pertinent to the topic you're looking at. Um, but as with any paper, we, once we've kind of consolidated our findings, we need to give them a bit of meaning. We need to summarise them and devise a conclusion in essence. Um, and having written the draft conclusion, it doesn't really feel any different from, to any other uh, discussion section of a research paper. Um, but again, the PRISMA guidance gives good description as to what you should include. So I think it goes into summary of evidence, uh, the limitations, and then the conclusion section. Um, and we need to illustrate the relevance of our findings once we've done this so that we can uh, show the impact that it could have and what we need to change, etc. cetera. Um, we also need to discuss the limitations. This includes both in terms of the outcomes measured and um, of the methods that we use to conduct the systematic review. So it's discussing limitations of the papers included and of our process. And then finally, as you'd expect, you write up the conclusions. Um, we interpret the findings in relation to the available research and the primary concepts on the topic and illustrate any uh, implications for future research. Um, I know it sounds long-winded and I point it really felt it, but it, I feel like I've, we've achieved something, um, achieved something really good and really important. Um, and it's, I suppose it's a different string to a bow, whereas I've been used to doing other pieces of research, more primary research. This feels um, a good way of consolidating knowledge and giving understanding um, that may not have been consolidated, consolidated before. Um, and it is a long process. And the first half of it, I felt like I was constantly getting it wrong. Um, but that was just because I hadn't come to it before. I think if I was to conduct another systematic review, I'd know the process. Um, and it is a trial and error thing until you finally got the papers you need to start sifting through. Um, and once you get to actually read the papers, because you've got an interest in the topic, it'll probably become a lot more um, enjoyable and a lot easier to do. I know it did for me anyway. Um, and I did, as you can notice on the screen, I did find a lot of benefits to conducting the systematic review. Uh, talking from my own experience, uh, as a first year uh, PhD with very limited practical research experience, it's given me the chance to learn a lot more about my topic, uh, dementia care pathways, uh, that I may not have been able to um, otherwise. It's present, presented me with a lot of knowledge of the key authors in the field I'm studying. Um, it's given me um, an idea of how routine data has been used for such work before, so that I've got an idea of how it may, I may use it in my PhD. Um, and finally, it's given me a great opportunity to write a paper, understand what journals may want from me in that sense, and to try and get something published very early on in my PhD. Um, so that's my seemingly long-winded presentation around systematic reviews. Thank you very much for listening. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask the first question, which is, um, it's a bit of an obvious one, but given this all over again, what would you do differently next time around? I assume this won't be your only systematic review. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I don't know whether it will be my only systematic review. Um, it seems to be a, something that's coming about a lot more. Um, I don't know whether it's because people don't have as much time or there's so much evidence out there that people are trying to consolidate it a lot more. Um, but in terms of, I wouldn't worry as much. Um, I try not to stress out about every um, being as defined as possible because although the process itself is defined in terms of you have your search strategy within that there is flexibility so don't become oh don't overburden myself and don't become too stressed particularly during lockdown it's it could have 
spiraled me a little bit, but maintaining focus on what the aims at the end are rather than on the process itself that I'm going through. So yeah, just trying to be a bit more pragmatic about it, I think. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. And keeping the scope tight as well, I know, I know it's quite easy to, to set quite a wide scope and then suddenly find yourself absolutely overwhelmed with so much to to consider. Um, <clears throat> we started the idea was to look into something very much defined based on my phd topic so it was broadly around inequalities in dementia care and i think that's where i was getting the two hundred thousand results from so it was a case of thinking how can we be more defined and more um identify what we can get out of this and create something rather than be too broad and just have a wishy-washy a systematic review yeah I, I agree. Okay, we've, um, we'll go to our questions now. Thank you very much. Um, anybody who has questions, you can post those at the bottom. Um, Chloe Tulip asks, um, hi, what's the difference between metasynthesis and systematic review? I'll be honest, I don't know what <laughs> a metasynthesis is. I don't know whether that's a meta-analysis. Um, I suppose a meta, I'll answer it based on meta-analysis and hope that that's what you're after. Um, so systematic review is... I suppose it's a non-data-based meta-analysis to my mind. So a meta-analysis would amalgamate data um, from a variety of uh, pieces of research and then find one specific outcome having made the data itself stronger to an extent. Whereas my systematic review is using narrative synthesis. So given that there were so many outcome measures of diff so many different outcome measures and there was such a disparate um, use of methods, it was impossible to get one defined um, set of data. And so it was more about drawing out the definicity impact on um, the use of or initiation of anti-dementia drugs, did age impact on the likelihood of being admitted to long-term nursing care, it wasn't possible to get the data. It was more amalgamating the findings from their study rather than the data. So um, I hope that that answered the question. If it didn't, I apologize. That's all right. Um, I hope that did as well, Chloe. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, next question's from, oh, I'm going to say uh, Rosti. Uh, I'm probably got that wrong. Um, did you consider case studies in your systematic review? And if you did, why? We didn't specifically look at case studies. I suppose case studies would have been more down the qualitative route if there were to be case studies included. Um, and we specifically devised this to look at routine and cohort data sets. Um, because of the topic of my PhD, it was trying to get the most out of that in, re in relation to my PhD as well. So it's not only trying to help get a paper that gives outcomes, says, does, do socioeconomic factors impact the dementia care pathway for old people, but also give me an idea of how routine data sets can be used um, to do so in my uh, PhD. Um, and so, no, we didn't, we didn't consider case studies in, uh, in my systematic review. Thank you for the question. I should add as well that um, our website, uh, dementiaresearch.nihr.ac.uk, has a, a, a section at the top um, which is called Essential Tools. And in there is a big long list of lots of different things, but one of the um, categories in there is data sets and uh, what information and data you can access freely um, in there. So please do take a look if anybody's looking for um free to access data. Uh, next question is from Shabana. Hi, um, hi James, do you feel combining screening of the abstract and title, you save time and still arrive at the same outcome about relevance of papers? <clears throat> I, part of me thinks that um, trying to define the research papers by title is, makes it more difficult because some re big research papers may have um, a more literature based um, title if I could say that so it's a quote from the paper that may not necessarily strictly have meaning in relation to what you're looking for um, and so looking through the abstract kind of gives you a lot better idea of uh, what you're looking for and I suppose at that point 
it's taken out one stage of the process of looking by title. Because if you had got rid of those papers looking at title, you're only then going to then go on look through abstract. And it takes no time at all to look through title and abstract, to be honest, given that we, we had a few hundred papers at that point. And the abstracts tend to be seven to 10 lines long. So it's, it's not a long process once you get to that point to look through abstract. But looking through title and abstract at the same time did help us to not only save time, but we feel it definitely um, came to the same came to the same outcome of the papers we would and wouldn't have included. I think it highlights the importance as well then of how important that abstract is because you know when somebody f is following you behind and you're looking for citations, if you've not got a great abstract, it's it's very likely somebody's going to overlook your paper. Yeah, and that was one of the difficulties if. If you're searching for specific terms, if you're looking for, say, co cohort and routine data sets, if that's not stated in the title, then you're including it to the next stage anyway. So you have to read through the abstract to then define whether it did or not. So, yeah, a good abstract does help a lot in the systematic review, which I've come to realize. So I will be doing that in future. And actually, that leads on perfectly to our next question from uh, Danielle, who asks, uh, what software packages did you use for your systematic review? Because I know getting your search terms right and things can be really helpful. Um, in terms of software packages, um, I used once I'd exported the references, I used Mendeley a lot because it gives um, gives you the chance to put notes on your papers. Um, it gives you the chance to reference those papers, and it obviously it allows you to discard papers and include papers and export a reference list as well, which is it kind of does the job of referencing software as well as giving you the ability to no put notes on a paper so that you can come back to them and understand what was I looking at that paper for again? And then it, it helps you to interpret the findings as well, because you can kind of write on the paper, say, this is what it found. And it's almost not a copy and paste job, but you can highlight notes to yourself that were important at that time that you can then go back to. Fantastic. Sounds like a good plug for Mandalay. Uh, thank you for that question, Daniel. Uh, uh, Abigail Lee's question next says, thank you for your interesting talk. Did you use the con concept mapping or idea webbing during your narrative synthesis? And if so, do you have any tips? Um, I don't know what idea webbing is, but it sounds really interesting. Um, <laughs> I, To be honest, the way I've written up findings and discussion sessions before, I've kind of read through paper and even more so with the systematic review I've read through the papers uh, picked out pertinent points and kind of put them in a different word document I don't know if that seems a bit archaic uh, but that's kind of the way I've done it before and it's it helped me with this as well um, but I suppose it's, it's different for everyone and once uh, once you're in the process whatever works for you is best like I said there's no rigid rigidity within the structure if you know what I mean uh, you, you've got a bit of flexibility in how you go about it. And with the findings and discussion section, it's the same, I'd say, as any other research paper. You're just trying to put across what you found means. And so how, however you get to that point, um, it's completely up to you. But I did not use concept mapping, or I, I don't think I used idea webbing um, in doing mine. Um, that's all right. Thank you, James. Uh, Abigail, if, if you've used idea webbing um, and concept mapping and, and would like to present on those specific things or write a blog for us, please do let us know. They, they sound uh, useful tools. Thank you, Abigail. Um, Alison Elwood asks, I'm struggling to find studies which support my proposed methods. Um, do you think it's enough to say that the limitations of the uh, quantitative studies are are the lack of understanding why something is happening. I'm going to have to read this back. And now that we have some evidence that it is happening, can you can you also perhaps pop up that question on your screen, James, to read that back yourself? Yeah, um, um, I, I don't know whether it's saying that there's the depth of research is available and that's why um, we can't define why our methods may or may not work. I hope I've interpreted that right. Um, a lack of research is um, a more than a valid reason for saying that something is or isn't happening, I'd imagine. Um, and I suppose it gives you the backing to then go on and do more research in the area. Um, I hope that was the question, and I hope I've kind of answered it. It certainly makes for a short systematic review if there's not much published in that, that area. I suppose it's yeah. perhaps then widening your search to 
<clears throat> you know, to, to go further. And this is where I think, particularly for systematic reviews, library services can be, from your institution, can be a fantastic resource of advice and guidance and, and help you do that work. <clears throat> um, sorry, Alison, I'm not, not sure we, we were particularly helpful there, but thank you for asking and good luck, good luck finding more. Um, Thea House asks, do you have any advice for learning how to conduct a systematic review? Any recommended resources? Is there any online stuff you could perhaps point to, uh, James? Um, there's the Prisma and Prospero guidance I've gone into in my presentation. There's some references at the end of the presentation, so I don't know whether the presentation itself could be made available to people, and there's a few links through there. Um, I'll show this book um, that I got given. It's called Doing a Systematic Review, a Student's Guide. It's very helpful. Um, and also having someone who's done one before. So Clarissa Giebel is one of my um, supervisors and she's done a lot of research before um, and she's done systematic reviews before. So it was helpful having someone there to talk to who understood the process and was not only good at doing it, but was also a calming influence when I may have felt like screaming a little bit because the process got a bit overwhelming. Um, but yeah, I'd, initially I'd say the Prospero and Prisma guidance are the place to look if you're looking at um, just what you need to do and what you need to include. Yeah, I think that's uh, good points. And, and again, just another plug for the library services who can be, who can be very helpful and have a lot of online resources um, and online tutorials and things. Um, uh, Jan asks, uh, could you explain a bit more about the protocol? How does it apply to the literature review? So the protocol itself um, is a kind of, a, it's a 40 question um, setup. Um, and it basically, it goes into, asks you what your review question is, um, asks you to define your search criteria, um, ask you what the participants or population what you're looking at is, what the interventions or exposures are, what the main outcomes you intend to look for are. Um, so in that sense, it's helping to define your research question so then that you can have specific search terms that you need to look for for the literature to include. And it, the inclusion exclusion criteria you've defined within the protocol um, are those that you will then use throughout and you should refer back to at every point, even when you're writing up your findings and discussion, so that you can say that it's basically a way of saying this study is or isn't strong, the research within it is of a good or bad quality, and the findings and discussions we have derived from that research have found this and they are either strong or weak. Um, so it's about identifying the strength of the research in the area um, how much available research there is, then stating what the impact of that is. So is it that we need to put more research in the area? Is it that we need to make a policy change? Is it we need to do um, make changes in hospital care, etc.? So it's, it's defining the strength of what we've done. It's defining the strength of the research in the area. And there are lots of um, examples of protocols and things online I know I've found and we have a WhatsApp group um, so if you uh, visit our website and go to the um, uh, I think it's ask an expert section at the top of the page you'll find information on to join our WhatsApp group where I know this is a very supportive community that have, have in the past been great at sharing examples of the protocols and things that they've written to inform this this kind of work. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we've got quite a few to get through. So well done. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have a question from Chloe next, um, who asks, thanks for answering my last question. Just another quick one, a bit unrelated. Are you guys aware of anyone studying sleep and dementia specifically? It would be great to link up with other early career researchers. I think I'm going to take that one, uh, James. Again, I would point you to our WhatsApp community. Um, I know that there is a specific sleep and COVID study, which is which is recruiting on joint dementia research right now and various pharma companies. And, and there's been quite a lot of work looking at sleep and dementia. So please do join our WhatsApp community and I'm sure we can point you in the direction of, of some of those papers uh, that we know about, Chloe. Thank you. Um, next, oh, I think 
Yep, oh, yep, yeah, that's right. I'll answer the right one. Um, next question is from Isabel. Hi, James. Do you have any recommendations in terms of software providing instruments for quality appraisal, like uh, Covidence AP Reviewer and JBI Summary? Did you use any of those? because it's more of a social science review or that the methods and the outputs that the research included were so disparate or the fact that I used a narrative review but throughout the process it wasn't a necessity to use any software packages it was more a discussion between myself and Clarissa around the inclusion criteria the quality rating of the papers and then the narrative synthesis at the end which didn't really lend itself to using any software packages for quality appraisal. So I am not aware of any of those packages, unfortunately, um, but maybe in future I'll be using those on a different kind of review. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, next question is from uh, Maria who asks, hi James, for this, thanks for this very informative session. Would it be possible to share the presentation as well as some of the content was a little bit hard to read? Um, if you'd like to send me those slides, we'll, we'll make sure that those those are available. Uh, there'll be a link when we post this back on our website. We'll include a link, and it'll be on YouTube uh, as well. Uh, um, Mabel asks, "Hi, thank you for the informative talk. I would like to ask if there are if you already have written." Uh, Sorry, if you are already done with writing your systematic review, which you registered in Prospero, and then you discovered that someone just published the same topic in a journal, but the authors did not register in Prospero, can you still publish your paper or can't you? I think that's a bit of a tricky one for perhaps us to answer. Have you got a view on that, James? I'd say publish anyway, right? I mean, I mean you get lots of things published on the same topic. That's the whole point of research. already put it on Prospero then that's a different point but if you're sending something not having known about it and uh, I wouldn't say it would affect the amount of editors or publishers that are likely to publish your work the more work in the area the better probably <clears throat> absolutely um, uh, we have uh, Philip Dean who um, it's not a specific question but he's highlighting that there are new guidelines available Oh, he's given a URL, uh, especially for open science and non-intervention systematic reviews written by PhDs. I, I will read this URL out for you. Uh, it's um, https colon forward slash forward slash n-i-r-o nero uh, hyphen s-r dot net liffy n-e-t-l-i-f for freddy y dot app. Um, I, if I can extract that from the comments afterwards, I will include a, a link to that as well. Thank you for highlighting that, uh, Philip. Um, uh, Alison Elwood says, yes, it was helpful. Uh, that was my thinking too. Just need to justify more explanation. It seems specific groups more likely to suffer from my condition. Oh, I, th I think this is a, a follow-up on the uh, question from before, looking at cognitive frailty, but nothing in depth which is why she's he's having a look so good luck with that uh alison um and she makes out this is very helpful um so thank you that's the last of our questions thank you ever so much uh there was a lot of questions there uh everybody for for putting those i'm sure uh we will include links to everything we've talked about uh today uh in the follow-up uh and the recording and again <clears throat> you'll find that on our website. So thank you very much, James. We're really grateful for you agreeing to share. If anybody would like to follow up with James, I know you can find him on Twitter. Um, his name is at JMS, uh, W A T S, uh, which is, I guess, James, uh, hyphenated what's so JMS W A T S on Twitter. Uh, our next webinar, as I mentioned at the start, is on Tuesday, the 9th of June, which is next Tuesday, um, at 12 30. We have Professor Claire Sir and Dr. Alice Griffiths, both from Leeds Beckett University, and they're going to present the results of their recent study looking into cancer care needs and the experiences of people living with dementia. So that's uh, one I'm very much looking forward to with some uh, interesting new results. Uh, as I've mentioned a few times, the recording from today's uh, webinar details of future ones and uh, able to re 
register for the next week's, you'll find on our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars. If you register on there as well, we send out a Friday bulletin, which has a summary of all the news from the week, um, which does often include um, uh, blogs. Um, I know James recently wrote one for us discussing his work on this systematic review. We have a fortnightly uh, podcast as well, and you'll find details of all those and career topics and things on different people's research in that Friday news bulletin. Finally, if you'd like to uh, join us and present your own research as a midday lecture, we're very much uh, welcome you to do that. Uh, please drop us a line on Twitter. Uh, our name is at dem underscore researcher, or you can use the contact page on our website. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and for all your questions. And thank you, James, for agreeing to share. And we hope to welcome you back a little bit later on in your PhD as you can perhaps discuss more of your work. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.